right. Good evening, guys. I'm late. I know I'm late. But we're going to see how much we can get done tonight. If you are out there and you're waiting for the Living Water live stream Bible study, we are live. Praise God. Uh, let me move all of this Greek out of my face. And I will try to switch gears. I'm taking this class. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had, I had Greek in, in seminary, but it was for exegetical purposes. And this is, this is for reading like so that you can strictly read the um, Greek without the English. And the class was at six, which would have made it an hour and I would have had time to get off of that and jump on this. And then they changed it to 6.30. So um, like, oh God, I can only sit in on like, you know, half of the class and then I have to leave. And the instructor was asking me to translate something from English into Greek, just as I was trying to log off. So thank you guys for being patient. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, we are, of course, studying the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're in the book of Revelation, and it would help if I had a Bible in front of me. Let me grab one. All righty. Because you're going to need a Bible tonight. We got a lot of reading to do um, if, if we get to it. If we get to Revelation chapter 13, we got a lot of reading to do. Okay, so share the link. The notes, I believe there's a new set of notes posted just in case we finish up this. I think we will. So I'm going to pray. And we are going to very quickly jump right into where we left off. I won't be able to review. You'll have to um, go to my YouTube um, page where all the previous studies are there. The, um, the video of all the previous classes that we have done are on my YouTube page. Man, and I can really feel the presence of the Lord all of a sudden. So let's go ahead and um, and get started. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to gather together, to break open the bread of life, to drink deep from the reservoirs of your anointing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You are our master teacher for unfolding revelation from the revelation of Christ and helping us to know how to live how to stand, how to serve, how to witness in these in times in which we find ourselves living. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness, your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Be with us as we study your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. If you're out there, just um, say hello. Let me know. I see that there are several viewers and I see comments, but the comments are not popping up on my um, screen for some reason. Oh, there they go. All right. They were trying to hide your comments. Let's see who's in here. Hello, Kathy from Canada. Um, good evening, Gwendolyn. Good evening, Pastor Susan. That's my, my, my peeps down in Mississippi. My daughter um, is on Catherine. Good evening, Catherine. Good evening, Tricia. Tricia Arnold was a former um, member of my church back in the day. My kids used to hang out, at least my son was really good friends with, with her son, used to hang out at her house. My cousin, Terry, <laughs> you guys will really have to put up with him soon because his month is coming up, his birthday, I believe, must be in um, August because He'll be, he'll be wearing us out with that Leo stuff. 
Hello, Sharon. Uh, good to see you, Loretta. Um, Amy, my tribe in um, uh, Canada. Praise God. It's my fam. They're, they're family. Um, uh, Leo season. <laughs> see, there he goes. Y'all don't mind him. <laughs> He's my cousin. You got to love him. Um, uh, and good evening to my good friend, Mayu. Okay, grab your Bible. Get your notes from last week. And let's do this because um uh chapter 13 is so interesting so i'm gonna try to get us there um okay so in your notes we're in revelation 12 and we are um we had just finished um looking at um verse 12 we are down to revelation 12 uh verse 12 um Okay, the devil's wreaking havoc because he knows his time is short. And then we got to uh, verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And we know um, that is Israel. Okay, so we're in the part of the notes where it says Satan persecutes the nation of Israel. Okay, so Satan will persecute the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. The scripture says that. We've seen that down throughout history. We are already, if you pay attention to the news, you'll see the rise of anti-Semitism throughout our world even today. And it depends on what administration is in the White House too as to how America maintains its promises um, to the nation of Israel. We've had some, um, uh, you know, presidential, um, um, you know, off, uh, presidents or, you know, their whole team that were really anti-Israel. Um, so you have to pay attention because Israel is God's prophetic end time, time clock, okay? So Revelation 12 and verse 14 says that Israel will have protection from Satan. So look at it. It says, but the two wings, now you have to highlight this, underline it, whatever you need to do, this is going to come up again, this verse. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent, okay? So notice that Israel will flee into her place. Well, where's Israel's place? Well, there were all kinds of theories. Some said that um, um, the, the Jews would flee into Petra, which is um, in southern Jordan. Uh, um, people believe that there are many that will go there to hide. However, the only people who believe this theory are those who have never been to Petra. If you've ever been to Israel and visited Petra, because um, there's, there's thousands of, of tourists who visit there every day. It has a maximum population of about 800 people, and it should be, um, I mean, or it, it, it used to be a fortress back in biblical times. However, today it is a death trap because there are rock walls on every side about 300 feet high. Now, back in ancient days, that would have been a fortress. But in modern times where you have things that can fly overhead, you can launch bombs. One bomb in the middle of Petra would kill everyone there. So there's an entrance, entrance into Petra, which is called the Wadi. Um, it's about a mile and a half long. At some points, it's only 12 feet wide. So if you got a handful of men in there, they could withstand an entire army because they would bottle them up in there and pick them off as they attempted to come through. And so Israel's place for protection during this um, tribulation period will not be Petra. There's no scriptural basis to believe that whatsoever. Oh, I see my Aunt Mary and my cousin Mary. Yay. They are here. I was wondering where they were. 
I'm glad that they joined us. Okay, so where is Israel's place then? Well, it's found in Genesis 15 and verse 18. And it says, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river to the river Euphrates. So God made a covenant with Abraham. The land on which he dwelled would be his and his descendants after him forever. So Abraham was in Israel at this time. He was in the area of Beersheba, which is about 40 miles south of Jerusalem. So this is Israel's place. It is the promised land for them. What did the Bible mean when it said the woman would be given two wings of a great eagle? Now, this is very important, particularly when we get to um, chapter 13. Israel would be given two wings of a great eagle. Now, you have to remember uh, the book of Revelation is a prophetic book. It is a Jewish book written to a Jewish audience who the writer um, would have known, understood the symbolism, okay? Um, we have to try to apply it. So John is looking down through um, human history and he's using symbols to interpret, you know, or to, to, to share with us what the Lord was showing him. And it's, it's just very interesting because um, there's one nation on earth today who is recognized um, for a symbol, which is an eagle. And that nation happens to be the United States of America. The United States of America is the nation whose symbol is the eagle. And the USA, like I said, depending upon what administration is in the White House, <clears throat> but historically, the USA is Israel's very best friend. The United States has used its military might to protect Israel from her enemies um, for several decades. It, it, it has also repeatedly used its veto power in the UN Security Council to protect Israel from the hatred of the United Nations, except for when um, uh, the Obama administration was really anti-Israel. They, they didn't do some of the stuff they could have done to be more protective. But if you look back at some of the things that happened during those eight years, regarding the United States and Israel. But Israel and the United States are allies, okay? So then, then when you think about that, the wings of the great eagle, Israel received those for um, um, to aid in its escape. Um, so what does the phrase a time and times and half a time mean? Well, that phrase is used several times in the Bible, okay? A time is one year, times is two years, and a half time is half a year. And so a time times and half a time is three and a half years. Daniel, the seventh chapter, tells us that the Antichrist will make war against the saints. We're going to look at this more in depth in just a few minutes. But it says that the Antichrist will make war against the saints for a time, times, and half a time until the Ancient of Days comes. So it is a picture of the Great Tribulation and the three and a half years right before the second coming of the Lord. Okay, And we, we have already established over the course of, man, several months now, a few months, that the church is going to be here, okay? We, it's, I, I would love to believe the church is not going to be here. I just don't see any scriptural evidence. I think that the argument of the pre-trib, even mid-trib, just kind of falls apart, okay? When you examine the scripture for what it actually had, says. And I think that a part of the challenge is that We've seen too many movies. 
We all, many of us like me, read the Left Behind series, which reads very, it's very intriguing, but you know, it's biblically accurate. You know, you make the, you make the, the, you figure it out. Okay. But from what we've been studying over all these months, I don't think that the pre-trip position is accurate. So how do we know it is three and one half years? Because the exact same prophecy is given in Revelation 13 and verse 5, which we're going to get to in a few minutes, which says the Antichrist will have power to continue for 42 months. Instead of using time, time, and half a time, it uses 42 months. There's also a reference to 1,260 days, which again, three and a half years. So Revelation 13, 7, which we'll come to, says he makes war against the saints and overcame them during that time period. This is absolute proof the Great Tribulation is 42 months or three and one half years, not seven. So those who teach that the, the, when Jesus speaks of tribulation, he speaks of the Great Tribulation, it is a three and a half year period of time, not that whole seven year period of time, okay? So Satan will attempt to destroy Israel according to Revelation 12 and verse 15. The serpent poured out um, water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. And you have to remember this chapter is written in symbolic language. So what do the waters symbolize? Well, Look real quick at Revelation 17 and verse 15. Flip over there and you'll see that it says, And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and crowds and nations and tongues. So waters can be a prophetic symbol for nations, people, multitudes, armies. Okay, in Revelation 17, the prophes um, the prophes prophesies that the waters represent multitudes of people. So when you look back at, when we let scripture interpret scripture, when you look back at Revelation 12, um, you can see then in verse 15, when the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. That could be a prophetic picture of armies coming after Israel during this particular time. But the Bible says that God will fight for Jerusalem. Through all, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it, God will fight for Israel. So this is referring to the time of the battle of Armageddon. Zechariah, the prophet, um, in chapter 14 and verse 2 says, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. These prophecies will be fulfilled. They absolutely will be fulfilled at the end of the three and a half year period. The, 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 the armies of the earth will gather in that tiny little area to fight against Israel. It is just insane because it is a sliver of land when, it, when you look at the, the, the size of other nations of the earth. But what makes it significant, it is, it is um, where God will establish his throne it is where his temple was built. It is where the blood of Christ was shed and the enemy hates that land. Okay. So look at verse 16 in Revelation chapter 12, um, which tells us what will happen when Satan comes down against Israel like a flood. When these, when these armies come against Israel, look what happens. It says, but the earth helped the woman which is, and remember that from our previous lessons, the woman is um, a symbolic picture of the nation of Israel. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river, which the dragon poured out of his mouth. Could the earth opening up refer to the earthquake 
that is prophesied in Revelation 11 and verse 13. Because remember, during these end times, um, um, when you get to that battle, um, there will be a huge earthquake. So is this another reference to it? You remember what we've established is that it seems that John seems to be seeing the same event and he's describing it in different ways, okay? And so look, um, remember Revelation 11 and verse 13, remember that passage of, of, of scripture says, and in that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and thousands, 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Well, the people that were terrified and given glory, could that be the people of Israel that were saved? Could those 7,000 be the armies, the numbers of the, 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 the people that are in those armies, that the, the waters that come to swallow up Israel? This same earthquake is prophesied in Zechariah 14 and verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. Could this be the earth opening up like a huge earthquake to help Israel? Could this earthquake um, be the one that is prophesied also in which the 7,000 die? It seems like a very strong possibility. And just, you know, what's coming up in my spirit right now a, a, a classic example of that, um, I don't know if I'm be able to find the reference fast enough, but in um, it's either in Exodus, it's in the, the narrative where um, uh, Moses leads the people out of um, Israel. And you remember Korah and Dathan, um, they rose up and they came, oh, where is it? Uh, somebody find the reference for me. Um, I don't have to, I can't like find it fast enough, but there's a story of Korah and Dathan in the Old Testament during the time of Moses led a revolt against Moses and there were people that stood with them and the scripture says <laughs> that the ground opened up. Oh, where is that? I, I gotta, I gotta Google it uh, because Korah. And Dathan um, coming against Moses. Okay, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Um, numbers. Oh, number 16. Uh, did I beat? I think I'm, nobody responded in the chat, so I must have beat everybody. Number 16. Look at this real quick. Korah's Rebellion. Um... Let me see. Um, they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far for all in the congregation are holy and whatever Moses had done, they didn't like it. And um, so they came against um, uh, Moses and um, let's see, it goes on. Um, let's see. They, so Moses says, you know, you guys come in the morning or tomorrow. We're going to present ourselves before the Lord. Every one of you take your censer, put incense on it. And they were arguing over the priesthood and, and the, the instructions that God had given. Korah and Dathan didn't like it. Where's the, the verse that says... Um, um okay look at um look down at around verse 28 and moses said hereby you shall know that the lord has sent me to do all 
these works and that it has not been of my own accord. If this, if these men die as all men die, or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. Now look at verse 31 and 32. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, this is in number 16 verses 31 and 32, the ground under them split apart and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belong to Korah and all their goods. So they, so they and all that belong to them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Um, fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense that had no business doing it. And so listen, if that happened, then you know the, the God of all creation is able to do that again in the end times during that battle of Armageddon period when those come against Israel. The scripture says the earth is going to open, 7,000 people will be swallowed up and will die. Okay, so back to Revelation 12, let's look at verse 17. Okay, um, so the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commands of God and have the witness of Jesus. So the Antichrist or the, 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 this, this, um, the dragon, um, which is the devil, that's Satan, and whatever forces he's using, will make war against two entities, against Israel and against believers, those who have the witness of Jesus, of, of Jesus Christ, and or Messianic believers, Jews who have the witness of Jesus Christ. They are Christians, they're Messianic Christians. So the enemy is going to come against those two groups. Every Jewish person on earth should either get to Israel or to the United States uh, when they sense that season coming. This tells us there will be another Jewish Holocaust coming, but there are places of safety for all who heed the warning because the Antichrist is going to come against the nation of Israel. True Christians will also bear the brunt of the great tribulation period. And see, this is why you have that whole camp that wants to think they're not going to be here and that they won't have to endure anything. I just don't I, I just, it, it just doesn't line up with um, the history concerning the people of God. The New Testament church endured great persecution and the church has endured and continues today around the world to, to endure tribulation and persecution. And so um, Christians, true Christians, those who will refuse to um, bow down and worship the beast, which we're going to see coming up um, in um, the next chapter, those people um, will bear the brunt of the great tribulation. Most people who call themselves Christians will compromise and they will follow the false prophet into an alliance with the Antichrist. You can see that happening already. You have Christians that compromise the word of God, that um, compromise certain things to, in order to accommodate the flesh and to do what they want to do and live how they want to live and think that God is going to co-sign it and they're going to go sliding into heaven. It doesn't work like that. True believers, true followers of Jesus Christ will hold fast and um, will not join the one world religion of the false prophet, but they will stay true to Jesus Christ until he returns. They will persevere, okay? Persevere no matter what. You never, ever, ever, ever renounce the faith 
in Jesus Christ, but you be a witness, which is what the book of Acts says, that is where we get the word martyr from. Even if it costs your life, you never renounce Jesus as Lord, okay? So now this next chapter, which we're getting ready to start, um is very important it's going to take us a while it's going to take us a couple of weeks to unpack revelation 13 because you're going to see we have to understand the prophecies that support it in order to understand the chapter so that chapter chapter 13 which is coming up next like right now um, provides us an overview of Satan's master plan for the end time. This chapter discloses which nations will make up the world government of the Antichrist. It's so good. So I hope you got the notes that I put on my page um, uh, a little bit earlier today. I gave you the first half. That whole, I, there's more, I think I have more than 30 pages of notes, maybe 40. So I only put a few of them on, you know, so it's, it's a lot of notes just for chapter 13. Um, this chapter discloses the nations that are going to make up the world government. Um, there's a description of the false prophet and his one world religion, the mechanism which the Antichrist will use to force his will upon the human race is also described. The mechanism is called the mark of the beast. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's jump into it. Man, it has taken us a while to get here, but we are here. Okay. The entire 13th chapter of Revelation is devoted to Satan's plan for the end time. It is interesting that Satan's chapter would be chapter 13. And again, we are drawing heavily from the teachings of Irvin Baxter, understanding the end time. Um, this is the DVD set, but I've got his, his study manuals that I have been pulling notes from and um, sharing my own insights. And so I like to give credit where credit is due. Um, his um, ministry is called End Time Ministries. In they have interesting discussions. They deal with like the, the news today and how it relates to end time prophecy. So let's look at Revelation 13 um, verses 1 through 8 describe the Antichrist and the nations who will make up his world government. And this stuff is so interesting. Verses 11 through 15 describe the one world religion of the end time and the leader of that global religion who is referred to as the false prophet, okay? So verses 16 and 18 describe the or 16 through 18 will describe the economic system of the global government listen by the time we finish with chapter 13 if the hair isn't standing up on your arms and on top of your head i don't know what's going on because this stuff is playing out right now while we are alive and breathing okay economic control say it with me economic control will be the mechanism used to force conformity to the world government and the global religion this economic control this economic system will be called the mark of the beast okay now listen people when you watch the news you have to know, you, you have to listen and watch prophetically and know that these people are not telling you the truth, okay? Rarely, rarely are many of these major networks telling you the truth, okay? The, the, it, as this thing begins to play out, economic control is what you can see it happening already global pan pandemic pandemic we're in a, a recession 
um, prices going through the roof. They're projecting food shortages coming up like you know, before the end of the year or very soon, you've got America selling hundreds and hundreds of acres of farmland to China. Okay, are you guys, are you, are you guys out there that you have your current administration selling millions of barrels of gas to China? And our prices going through the roof as opposed to putting that gas into the American market, you have got a group of people strategically trying to crash the economic systems of the world. Okay, let me keep going. Let, let, let's just look at it in scripture. Because see, when you start talking about it, people think you're being political. And I'm not I am not condoning one party over against another. I am telling you, you need to think prophetically and you need to stop voting based on political party and begin to vote based on scripture and, and biblical principles. But anyway, because these people that we put in these positions are being used to shift us either out of time or on time into you know the fulfillment of these these scriptures so revelation 13 okay the prophecy foretelling the end time government is found in revelation 14 i'm, I'm sorry 13 revelation 13 verses 1 and 2 look at this revelation 13 verses 1 and 2 and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore then i saw a beast coming up out of the sea having 10 horns and seven heads and his horns were t on his horns were 10 diadems or crowns and on his head were blasphemous names and the beast which i saw was like a leopard and his feet were like those of a bear and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his throne of great authority. So whatever this political entity is, this governmental entity is, it will be empowered by the dragon. And we know the dragon is the, the Lucifer, Satan. Okay. All right. So in order for us to understand this prophecy, um, in order for us to understand this prophecy, wait one second, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, we have to pay attention to the symbols, okay? The symbols in the text um, that are used to describe the beast. The body of the leopard, the body of a leopard, the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, seven heads, 10 horns, okay? These symbols are clearly explained in other prophecies found in the Old Testament because remember, it is a Jewish book, Jewish, uh, Jewish um, um, symbols. So look at this. It is absolutely impossible to understand this chapter without first understanding the Old Testament prophecy that identifies these symbols. So what we are looking now at what could possibly be one of the most important prophecies, if not the most important prophecy in the entire Bible, and we find this in Daniel. So you must open your Bible to Daniel chapter 7 verses uh, one through eight. And we're going to look at these um, slowly without understanding. So get Daniel chapter seven. Okay. In the old Testament, Daniel lives back there by Ezekiel. You find Ezekiel, you'll find Daniel with, um, uh, so let's pause for a minute. We're, we're going to read. Uh, well, first let me read Daniel seven verses one through three. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream 
and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. Okay, let's, let's stop right there. So let's pause for a minute and point out that prophecy is almost always written in symbols, but they are symbols that will have meaning at the time of the prophetic fulfillment that they are written concerning. So the prophets, oftentimes when they wrote things, they wrote what God was giving them using the symbolic language that God was giving them. They didn't always understand what the symbols meant. But when we are in the age in which these, boy, man, I felt the anointing on that. When we are in the age in which these things are meant to pertain to, then the symbols will have great depth and clarity of meaning, okay? So these four beasts in Daniel 7 verses 1 through 8 were a lion with eagle's wings, a bear with three ribs in his mouth. And you have to have the notes because um, there are pictures in the notes, okay? So if you have an iPad, some kind of tablet, a laptop that you can open up. I hope that you can open up the, these notes. Or if you have a printer at home where you can print them out, you really need these notes alongside um, what, you know, we're teaching um, in chapter 13, okay? So these symbols with the four beasts, a lion with, a e with eagle's wings, a bear with three ribs in his mouth, a leopard with four heads, and four wings of a fowl, of some type of fowl, a bird, okay? The last beast was so different from anything that Daniel had ever seen, he really couldn't even give a name to it. He couldn't say, oh, that looks like a lion or a bear, or a, a man, that looks like a, a leopard with four heads and four wings of a fowl. This last beast was so different from anything, he simply described it as having 10 horns, okay? We don't have to guess what these things symbolize because the symbols are explained in the same chapter where the prophecy is given. Are you guys out there? Somebody say, okay, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Daniel 7. Um, let's look in the same chapter. Daniel 7. Look down at verse 17. These four great beasts are four kings or governmental leaders who shall arise out of the earth. Four leaders that shall arise out of the earth. Okay, go back and now, or um, uh, look, at, um, look at Daniel 7 and 23. Same chapter, verse 23. Thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the, the whole earth and trample it down and break it in pieces. Okay, so what do these beasts symbolize? Verse uh, 17 says they symbolize kings, but verse 23 says they symbolize kingdoms, okay? Um, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms. So a, a beast in Bible prophecy symbolizes a kingdom or a nation along with the ruler of that kingdom or nation. Okay, are you guys tracking with me? So this is the first big clue to understanding this very critical part of the prophecy that's in Revelation 13. But we got to understand the background as to what these symbols represent. <clears throat> Letting scripture um, interpret scripture and then seeing how that has been fulfilled or is being fulfilled in, in history. 
When will these kingdoms or these nations exist? Well, Daniel 7 is a prophecy that's over 2,000 years old. It is a 2,500 plus year old prophecy. Could it have been fulfilled a thousand years ago or, or 2,000 years ago? Or are we unwittingly, <laughs> like most of the church, just sitting around sucking his thumb, not paying attention to pertinent things, could we be watching the fulfillment right now? Could some people who have been alive for years, that people that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, my dad in his 90s, could he have been watching the fulfillment? Absolutely. Daniel 7, let's look at verse 9 for the answer. Daniel chapter 7 and verse number 9. And it says, as I looked, thrones were placed and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. So right after giving us the four different nations and the prophecies about them, Daniel says, I watched until the thrones of these kingdoms were cast down and the throne of the Lord was established. Okay. And so the, um, 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 the ancient of days, Jesus Christ seated on the throne throughout the Bible, we're told mankind will be allowed to rule himself until it becomes obvious he has no idea what he's doing. He has made a mess of things and he cannot rule himself, okay? And um, so when you see, um, in order for the throne of the Lord to be established, other thrones are um, overthrown, okay? So, um, in your notes, there's some pictures, just some animations of like the, the leopard with the um, foreheads, with the um, wings of a fowl, the beast with the ten horns, the ancient of days um, seated. So it is obvious this prophecy could not have been fulfilled um, a thousand or two thousand years ago. It states that the thrones of Daniel will be cast down at the time Jesus returns to the earth. He will put down the thrones of men and the throne of the ancient of days will be established and he will be crowned king of kings and lord of lords. He will then usher in his thousand year kingdom, which we normally refer to as the millennial uh, kingdom. Let me see. Let me... Um Real quick, let me look at um, that chapter in another translation. Let me look at, uh, let's see, Daniel 7. Uh, where am I? Let's go down to around verse, uh, let's start in verse 3. Um, I want a different translation. I want the King James... Okay, the first was like a lion and had um, eagle's wings. I beheld to the wings, okay, and they were plucked off, okay, and behold, and, and I saw the night visions, okay. Um, where's the verse I'm looking for? I'm looking for the, the verse about the, um, oh, 7, 9. Let me see how it reads in the King James. Oh, yeah, see, King James, see, the ESV reads different than the King James, I like it better in the King James. The See, the ESV says, I looked and thrones were placed. That implies thrones are being set up. The King James says, I beheld to the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. So to solve this problem, we're going to look at it in the Hebrew, Daniel 7 and verse 9 and see who do be right okay let's look at daniel 7 and verse 9 let me see if i can find um daniel 7 i'm gonna look at it in the hebrew give me just one second 
Daniel 7 and verse 9. Uh, cast down. Okay, that is the word rema, and it means to throw, to set, to impose, to cast down. Okay, thrones were placed, thrones were cast down, thrones were imposed in the ancient of days. Okay, um, the word can can it can mean both things. So it can mean there were thrones cast down, overthrown, and there were other thrones that were set and imposed on those on those other thrones and the ancient of days took his seat. So yeah, it, it means just what I thought it meant. Okay. So Daniel 7 9, um, clearly there are thrones that are cast down when Jesus returns um to the earth. And so he will put down the thrones of men. He will be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He will then usher in his um, 1,000 year kingdom, which we normally refer to as the millennial kingdom. Um, Daniel 7 and verse 11. Let's look at that um, because this gives us an even clearer picture as to when these nations will be upon the earth. And that's what we, and then I looked because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And, and as I looked, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. So um, we're going to discover the 10 horns and the last beast symbolized the 10 kings. But if you look at this, this happens, this stuff is happening when the beast is killed. So that has to be at the end of the tribulation period, uh, okay? So we're going to discover the 10 horns and, and the last beast symbolize the 10 kings. Then another horn comes up from among the 10 kings, uprooting three of them. Um, the last horn that comes up from among the 10 will then become very great and become the Antichrist. When Jesus Christ comes, the Antichrist, who will have been ruling a one world government for a short period of time in that three and a half year window, will be destroyed. This leader called the Antichrist is sometimes also referred to as the beast. The beast, the Antichrist, the beast, the Antichrist, same thing. This passage in Daniel 7 and verse 11, look at it again. I looked then because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. And so this passage in Daniel 7, 11 explains that the body of this beast will be destroyed and given to the burning flames. Another scripture um, reveals the same information that was found and that scripture was found in Revelations 19 and verse 20. And it says, and the beast was taken and with him, the this is all referring to, you know, at the end of these things, at the end of this tribulation period, the beast is taken with him, the false prophet that um, wrought the miracles before him, which he deceived, which with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. They were both cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So these passages of scripture are giving us um, they're, they're breaking, pulling back the veil so that we will understand the language that is in Revelation 13. That, that's what I'm trying to do. The Antichrist and his religious partner will be cast into the lake of fire at the second coming of Christ. So watch closely because this next verse gives us critical information. We're in Daniel 7 because Daniel 7 is like the, 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 gives us the definitions of the symbols we see in Revelation 13. That's why we're taking the time to, to look at Daniel 7. So look at Daniel 7 and verse 12, okay? Daniel 7 and verse 12. Um, as for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Um, remember, beasts represent nations. So this seems to say 
that the Antichrist is going to be destroyed at the second coming of Jesus, but the rest of these nations will be living during the millennial reign of Christ, okay? This means these nations will exist on earth at the time the Antichrist, um, at the time of the Antichrist, and they will continue on afterwards, okay? So let's make sure we, that we understand. When Christ comes and destroys the Antichrist and his one world government, the rest of the nations in Daniel 7 will also be existing on earth. So we need to be able to find the nations that are described in the symbolism, in other words, which we're going to do. When the Antichrist is destroyed, the other nations are not going to be destroyed. They're going to continue to live on the earth but under the rule of Jesus Christ and his church in a time called the millennium. And so this is a critical point we need to remember. Jesus Christ will return to the earth during the lifetime of these nations prophesied in Daniel 7. If we can prove that these nations all exist on earth right now, then we can prove that we are living in the era of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. Okay, so, um, if you, now, let me say this. If you have a study Bible and you ha it has some kind of commentary, sometimes they give you a traditional view in, in, in an effort to interpret Daniel 7. The traditional view, they'll say that these nations are, the, that the lion is Babylon, the bear is Media Persia, the leopard is Greece, and the tin horn kingdom is the Roman Empire. That's usually the pre-trib camp that'll say that. But is that what the Bible says? Okay, we're going to find out. Where does this belief come from? You know, because you can't back it up with scripture. So let's look at what the Bible says. In Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 and 21, there is a ram fighting against a he-goat. The ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Persia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So Daniel chapter 8 tells us that the ram is Media Persia, not the bear. That the bear is not Media Persia. The ram, some ram described in chapter 8 is Media Persia, okay? And so the, that traditional view could not be accurate. The goat, they say, is Greece, not the leopard, as has been commonly believed. Or the goat is Greece, not the leopard, as has been commonly believed. So all of these kingdoms in Daniel 7 have to be on earth at the time of the second uh, coming of Christ. Because look at that again, Daniel 8, verses 20 and 21. It tells you that the goat is Greece, okay? The ram is Media Persia. So the bear and the leopard would not be these nations that many of the pre-trip, you know, tradition teaches that they are. If, if, if they're wrong, then what's the right answer, okay? If we can prove these nations symbolized by the lion, the bear, and the leopard, and the ten-horned beast are on earth now, then we can prove we're in the time when Jesus could return. So let's see if we can prove it. Let's look at the lion, Daniel 7 and verse 4. There are four beasts. Okay. Oh, let me see what time is it. Okay. Let's keep going. Four beasts. Um, that come up out of the sea. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. What nation or is there a nation on the earth today that could be the lion? If you go to Webster's Third International Dictionary, it will tell you that the lion is a symbol of a country. What country? Great Britain, are you guys with me? 
If you go to London or if you've ever been to London and you stand in Trafalgar Square, there are four huge lions that represent that nation. I felt the anointing on that. One looking north, one looking south, one looking east, one looking west. While traveling through Great Britain, you will notice there are lions everywhere. The lion is the official symbol of the nation of Great Britain, also known as the United Kingdom. Put that on the board in your brain. Let's look at Revel um, Daniel 7 and verse 5, because we're going to see these symbols in Revelation 13. So this is the precursor, all right? Uh, Daniel 7 verse 5, and another beast, a second one like a bear, it was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. Okay, so look at this. Do you know which nation symbol is the bear? Russia. Russia is alive and well, and its symbol is a bear. Irvin Baxter, said. here's what he said. He said on May 21st, 1984, he picked up Time Magazine and on the front cover of the magazine was a picture of a big grizzly bear with biting the Olympic rings in two. The caption said, Olympic turmoil, why the Soviets said, yet. The story was that America boycotted the Olympics in 1980, which I, which I remember, you guys might remember that. In retaliation, the Soviets said, oh, you know, which is known as Russia said, okay, we're going to boycott in 1984. So this became the feature story in Time Magazine that week. The graphic artist designed a picture of a big Russian bear biting three Olympic ring, the Olympic rings in two. And the caption said, why the Soviets said, yet, yet is the Russian word for no. Then he says he found another magazine called The Economist, which was dated February 6th through the 12th, 1999. On his front cover, they used a picture of the Russian bear. The caption said, Russia, financial outcast. There on the front page was a picture of a bear trying to get honey out of an empty pot because the Russian finances at that time were in horrible disarray. <clears throat> then July 4th through the 10th, 2009, there was another cover on The Economist, a picture of President Obama walking up the steps of an airplane as he was leaving to make his first foreign visit to Russia. And the picture depicted him as he reached the top of the stairs, walking into the jaws of the Russian bear. Okay, and I put that picture in your notes. The Economist magazine is known as the most influential periodical in the world. It's called the Periodical of Kings and Presidents and is published out of London by Lord Rothschild. The, econo the Economist used the bear to portray Russia, the very same symbol that God used to prophesy over 2,500 years ago. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. The second was like a bear, okay? So you've got Great Britain and you have Russia. <laughs> okay, so when God wanted to let us know which nations would be on earth at the time of his second coming, he used the official symbol of Great Britain, the lion, and the official symbol of Russia, the bear. And there's, there's pictures of those magazines. You can see it for yourself. The Indianapolis Star, January 4th, 1980, editorial page, big ball headline across the editorial page said, after the British lion, the Russian bear. What you gonna do with that? That's right out of scripture. The article was talking about Britain pulling out of the Middle East and Russia moving in. Um, to see the very symbols that God used over 2,500 years ago for Great Britain and Russia on the editorial page of a secular, secular newspaper who did not know it was prophesying, 
that is absolutely amazing okay and there's a picture of the headline so you can see now let's look at the eagle in daniel 7 and verse 4 look at this look look at this again the first was like a lion but the lion had eagle's wings okay look then as i looked its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and the mind of a man was given to it so you have this this um lion that has the eagle wings but the eagle's wings are broken off and made to stand like a, like a man okay so what in the world is that <clears throat> well listen the eagle is the official symbol of the United States of America. Just pick up a, a dollar bill. On the back of a dollar bill, you find the eagle. On the back of a dollar bill, it's the official symbol. Then you will see the American eagle. Look at the back of the dollar bill. That's our symbol. When you visit a post office, you usually see an American eagle. It's found on many of our governmental buildings because it is our official symbol, the United States of America. Well, listen, do you know your church, your, not your church history, your, your history, American history? Listen, the eagle's wings are depicted as grow, initially growing out of the back of the lion. Well, where did America come from? America grew out of Great, great Bitten, Great Bitten. Great Britain, our mother country. Go back and study history. The British, the British, the British are coming. Remember the American Revolution. America broke away from Great Britain. Daniel said the eagle's wings were broken off from the lion. That should be making like ding, 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 ding. You should be getting like alarms going off in your head. God foresaw the breaking away of America from Great Britain over 2300 years in advance that is that's that's prophecy another time magazine article dated october 27th that's my dad's birthday not 1980 but that day october 27 1980 depicted the eagle the u.s and the bear russia looking over the globe and the picture of that time magazine article is right there or covers there too so the globe had a fuse and the fuse was lit. The caption said, the Gulf, will it explode? It was talking about the Persian Gulf in the Middle East um, time during that. So using the symbols straight from the prophecies in Daniel 7. That, you know, so listen, if you don't understand the scriptures from a Hebraic perspective, then revelation doesn't make sense because these other prophecies are undergirding it. And these prophecies, God used symbolism that relates to today. Don't forget scripture says that the, the wings were broken off and the eagle was made to stand on his feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. We're going to look at that more in, in a few minutes. But the breaking away of the eagle's wings from the lion depicts the declaration of independence. L look at this. Look at this. This is American history. And it's so prophetic. Declaration of Independence says, when, when did that happen? July 4th, 7-4, 1776. So what is this? Daniel chapter 7, verse 4 prophesies the breaking away of the wings from the lion. Are you out there? <laughs> Did you see that? Did you see that? The, the United States, listen, and then it says that this, as it breaks away, the, these wings are going to stand up on like two feet like a man. Well, the United States has two symbols, the eagle and who's the man? Who's the man? Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam. So the, the typology fits perfectly to America. You got to get all of that in your head, understand these symbols. So when we get back into Revelation 13, where we were, this stuff will make sense. Okay, but come on, we got one more. 
Let, let's wait. Okay. Why did God give us all of these incredible prophecies? Because he wanted us to understand when he's coming. When you see these things happening, you know, the time draweth nigh near. He, he did, but listen, he didn't want everybody to understand. So he only gave understanding to those who would diligently seek him, those who would study the word, those who would get before him and say, Lord, what is this? Show it to me. You know, so because people that are playing games, they're not going to understand. Jesus even said, you know, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And, and um, he talked in parables and in symbolism. So let's look at the leopard real quick. Now we came on about 15 to, you know, 18 minutes late. So we're going to go a little past 830. Okay. Um, so we'll still be in our, in our normal time frame. So let's look at Daniel 7 and verse 6. Here comes another um, uh, symbol. After this, I looked and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. A leopard, a leopard, the symbol of a leopard. Um four wings of a fowl, four heads, dominion. Well, one of the things that Irvin Baxter said, he's man, he said he had to really pray. He fit the, he said the, 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 um, the lion, the, um, the eagle with the eagle's wings, the bear, those were, those were pretty simple with the help, help of the Holy Spirit to figure out. But the leopard was a little bit more challenging. So after spending a lot of time in prayer, he said the spirit of the Lord one day just whispered in his heart, go buy a newspaper. So he went to try to find a newspaper. And when he found a newspaper that day, it happened to say Germany sells tanks to the Netherlands. Well, what does that have to do with anything? So, but he had been praying, asking God, man, I felt the anointing on that to show him who the leopard was. Well, he knew America had an airplane called the Eagle Fighter after our national symbol. And so he wondered if Germany's symbol could be the leopard. Well, when he took the newspaper home and read the article, the article said the leopard tank was the world's number one tank. When he did further research, he discovered in Webster's online dictionary with multilingual translation, that leopard was the unofficial national animal of Nazi Germany, replacing the tiger, which was along with the eagle, the national animal of Germany. So when the Bible talks about the leopard, it says dominion was given to it. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you look back, if, if, if you put Germany like in your mind, one nation had started the, the last three major like world wars. The Franco-German War of 1870, Germany did that. World War I in 1914, World War II in 1939. They were all plotted, planned, and started by the leopard. Are you out there? It was called the German Malady, an article on April 9th, 1984. The word malady means sickness. The article said, since the time of Charlemagne, the area that is now Germany has been the pivot of European history. In the past 100 years, the Germans have dominated Europe intellectually, industrially, and militarily. So remember, dominion was given to the leopard. So all the pieces seem to be following, um, falling together. But why does the leopard have four heads? We're going to look at this and then we'll probably pick it up next week. In Daniel 7, regarding, um, the, in this prophecy, the lion had one head, the bear had one head, but the leopard had four heads. Why? Because a beast in prophecy symbolizes a nation or an empire, right? So multiple heads on a beast portray the number of times that nation will rise and fall. So Germany had the First Reich, 
the Second Reich, Hitler's famous Third Reich, which means kingdom, and the Fourth Reich, which is now rising. A man named Edward Hartrick wrote a book entitled The Fourth and Richest Reich, How the Germans Conquered the Post-War World. Since World War II, France and Germany have worked together to rebuild Europe. Now you gotta get this and we, we're gonna end with this. France and Germany worked together to rebuild Europe. The alliance was called the Franco-German Alliance. Together, you gotta get this. They built the common market, which has now become known as the European Union. The official symbol of France a rooster, which is a fowl, or bird, the wings of a fowl, okay? A leopard with the wings of a fowl, four-headed leopard with the wings of a fowl. Are you guys out there? In this prophecy, we see Germany with the wings of France, the rooster on its back, and the four heads of the leopard, the First Reich, Second Reich, Third Reich, and Fourth Reich. These prophecies are so dead on accurate in Daniel and they were written over 2,500 years ago and we are watching them come to pass in this age in which we currently live or our parents lived or our, like my, my, my dad and, and his siblings, my grandparents and myself, I've seen some of these things happen. Real quick, the 10 horned beast. The last beast in Daniel 7, in the Daniel 7 prophecy, is a beast with 10 horns, okay? The beast is described in Daniel 7 and verse 7. Look at Daniel 7 and verse 7. After this, I saw, because this all, we're going to see it in Revelation, okay? And after this, I saw in night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly, exceedingly strong. Um, it had a great iron feet. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the, the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Okay. What are the 10 horns? So again, we don't have to guess what the 10 horns are. If you keep reading in Daniel and you get to verse 24, he, he tells you what the ten what the horns are. As for the ten horns, out of this ten out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones, and he shall put down three kings. So, as we have learned, a beast represents a nation or kingdom. The ten horns on this beast symbolize ten kings that will form, or ten nations that will form an alliance together. Another prophecy about these same ten horns is found in Revelation 17. Oh, let me hurry up. Revelation 7, I'm running out of time. Revelation 17 and verses 12 through 14. And the ten horns that you saw are the ten kings or the ten kingdoms who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. Okay. Um, these are of one mind and they hand over their power and authority to the beast, this system this, that's led by the, 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 the devil. They will make war on the lamb and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are called, with the Lord are called chosen and faithful. Okay. So when we look at Daniel seven and eight and Revelation 12 um, and 14, which we just did, these will take place during the time of the Antichrist. This alliance of 10 kings will give their power and strength unto the Antichrist and together with the Antichrist, they will fight against the Lamb, Jesus Christ at his second coming. Pay attention when you see a conglomerate or a, a, a formation of 10 nations coming together, okay? 
Who is the little horn that Daniel said would rise among the ten nations? Daniel 7 and verse 8 answers that question. That came up among them a horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in his in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So Daniel 7 and verse 8 explains the little horn. The little horn that comes up to uproot the three will be the anti Christ. How do we know that it is the Antichrist? Because Daniel tells us, if you keep looking at the, the chapter, look down to verses 21 through 22. And as I look, this horn this made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Okay, and so listen, the little horn is the one that's making war against the saints and when the at, at the time when the ancient of days comes. That's the antichrist, okay? It describes the antichrist making war against the saints during the great tribulation period. The antichrist will rule a one world government. And I you know what? Um, okay, let's do that and then we'll stop. Daniel 7 and verse 23. And he says, as for the fourth beast, the fourth, there shall be a fourth kingdom. It'll be different from all the other kingdoms. It'll devour the whole earth, trample it down, break it into pieces. So the above scriptures tell us that the Antichrist will make war against the saints um, four times, times, and half a time, which is three and a half years. You, you see that in verse 25. It'll be, they, it'll be given into his hand for times, times, and half a time. That's three and a half years. That's the great tribulation period, the last three and a half years. Many commentaries teach the great tribulation is seven years. That is wrong. The, the, there's not one scripture that describes the great tribulation as being a seven year period of time. It is always three and a half years. There are six specific scriptures that say the great tribulation will last for three and a half years. In this chapter, it says the Antichrist makes war against the saints for a time times and half a times, which equals three and a half years. Okay, guys, we got to stop right there. I know it's getting good. We're going to pick it up next time. And you're going to see how, um, um, how these things play out, how these entities form an alliance and become that great beast that you see in um, um, Revelations chapter 13. So on the world circuit, pay attention Pay attention to Russia. Pay attention to what America is doing. Pay attention to who Russia aligns with. Pay attention to Great Britain. Pay, pay attention to, um, to um, Germany. Pay attention to these, these banks and these markets and all of that. These things are all coming together and we're going to pick it up next time. But for now, you have been watching the Living Water live stream Bible study. My name is Bernadine Wormley Daniels. It's my privilege to be able to, to wrestle with the text with you. Much thanks to End Time Ministries, um, Irvin Baxter, who passed away um, not too long ago, but for the work that he did and um, that his ministry continues to do, we're grateful. We're just looking at some, you know, what does the word say? You know, and at the end, when we finish the book of Revelation, you can make a decision for yourself. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Take care. God bless you. I will see you next time. If you want to sow into Soterios Ministries, I will put some links in the chat that you can check out after we go off um, the live feed. Take care and I'll see you next time. God bless.